<clears throat> Hi everyone. This is the lecture for early homo. So we're just going to get right into it. <clears throat> okay, so slide two. So the genus homo. So, be, so before, um, on the, the previous PowerPoints, we were talking about uh, the different hominin species. So we started talking about those early hominin genera like uh, Sahelanthropus, Auroran, Artipithecus, and then we moved on to talking about the Paranthropines and Australopithecines. Um, so, so that was, you know, the stuff that was covered on your on uh, exam two. So now we're kind of starting this next section, and we're continuing our discussion about hominins. We're just kind of moving along in time, and now we're going to start talking about our genus, the genus Homo. But right now, we're going to talk very specifically about some of the early um, species. In fact, I think I'm just going to talk about. I'm trying to think what I have on this PowerPoint. I think it's just two that I, for the most part, kind of talk about um, for the early the early. Uh, Homo, and then we cover um, some more info on the um, on later Homo. Okay, so early Homo. So if you go to slide two, I already said that. Um, so thinking about in terms of the other hominins that we had talked about and comparing them to, in general, the genus Homo. Um, what are some of those some of those main differences that we're seeing? Like, why would we, as scientists, as paleoanthropologists, designate a cutoff and say, okay, these species here were clearly, you know, Australopithecines or clearly Paranthropines or clear, whatever. And, and why would we then say, okay, this group here is clearly something different and we're going to give it a whole new genus name, Homo, and the different species, you know, like, what are the reasons why? Like, there's some behavioral stuff for sure. Um, but right now I have on, on, on this PowerPoint the, the list of the, the morphological or physical phenotypical features that are like clearly differentiating the earlier groups from this this genus from our genus okay so i have a few listed so we, in general we see even larger brain size so recall that that was one of those main features of hominins we talked about um one of the characterizing features is that we have large brains but of course as i've said multiple times we see brains getting bigger over time and so we're still seeing that trend but we do see a, a huge jump at early homo and it just continues to get larger and larger basically very quickly throughout our genus. Um, so brain size is definitely something that separates. Now it's not as if, now remember I've said this also multiple times, it's not as if suddenly, you know, um, like these individuals aren't born with labels. And so we are with our own human bias trying to kind of, you know, un understand and categorize and we put our own labels on them. Um, but a lot of these traits, you know, even though we might say, okay, this these traits characterize all hominins or these traits characterize this genus or this genus or this species um, there's still gonna be variation there's still gonna be um, you know a process to that so for these earlier ones especially homo habilis which I'll talk about in a second it's not as if there's this major huge significant uh, brain size jump although it does go fairly quickly after that um, so we're seeing a little bit of a brain uh, in size increase right, right away and then it just continues to get even, be even more so um, so the skulls, we also see that they become more rounder for, for the homo genus versus the others. And as we go through this PowerPoint and the next one about later homo, we see, I'll show you this trend, we see more of like a forehead. Um, uh, faces are getting smaller. So this is a general trend we see is heads get uh, bigger, rounder, faces get smaller, flatter. Like I said right here, less prognathism. And then the, there's no cresting. So we had seen cresting in some of those other uh, genera and um, we're not seeing any cresting with, with the genus Homo. Okay, so go to slide three, and you'll see one of my, you know, my charts again. Just to show you have a visual of the timeline that we're talking about in general. Um, last common ancestor with chimps, you know, about six million years ago. We talked, you know, very briefly before with those early genera. Then we spent some time talking about Australopithecines and Paranthropines. And now we're moving on to our genus, the genus Homo. And there's still some branching events, of course, you know, some, a combination of anagenesis and cladogenesis. Okay, so slide four, if you go to slide four, you'll see. So I'm gonna mostly focus discussion on Homo habilis and Homo erectus. So if you've you know, skimmed the book, you'll see the textbook, you'll see that they, they do mention a few others, um, but for the purposes of this course and what I'm gonna, you know, I'm expecting you to kind of take away from this course, um, it's just these two for early, for early Homo, Homo habilis, Homo erectus. Okay, so slide five. So 
as I said that right away, I'm bringing in another one. The, um, this is only to point out, and I, and I think I mentioned this on one of the previous PowerPoints that there, you know, when you're reading the textbook, this is true for any class, any, any, any field, you as a student, as an undergrad, you know, get a textbook and it, it has all this information and it seems as if, oh, this is what everyone agrees on. Here's the, here the, fa the facts of the matter. Like, and while they are facts because they're based on, you know, research and studies, um, it doesn't mean that some of this isn't, isn't without, you know, debate still in the field um, that scientists maybe don't fully agree or that it's still maybe even a little open to interpretation. So I talked about that with those with those early genera like Sahelanthropus that, um, you know, some would say it's, it's a hominin, some would say it's, maybe it's the last common ancestor with chimps, some would say, nah, it's probably just another ape. Like, you know, um, more evidence will, you know, hopefully fill in, fill in those gaps. But so anyway, so this one, this, this controversy, or this debate is the one I'm going to talk about just right now is pretty much resolved, but just know that some might say it's not. And, um, it's still, it's still something that's, that's discussed. So Homo habilis versus Homo rudolfensis. So there's this question of, um, you know, like, are these two different species? Are they one species? If they are one species, why do we see so many differences? If they're different species, why are there some, is there some overlap? Like, it's just a question. So I'm just kind of presenting some of this information to you. So you can see here in this picture that we have Homo habilis on the left and Homo rudolfensis on the right. These are the type specimens. And so even though you're seeing this two-dimensional picture, you can probably already start thinking, even with like not a lot of knowledge base in this field, you might start seeing some general similarities, but you also might be noticing some general differences. And this is where the debate comes in. Um, and so like I've mentioned multiple times before, I'm never going to ask you like to give me the exact dates, but just as, hope, as long as you're understanding like the general like progression of time. Um, so Homo habilis is the first species in this genus. And, and like I said, here, here are those two specimens. Those are the specimen numbers. You don't need to know that. But if you go to the next slide, slide six, you'll see another view of them, the top down view, and you can see even more some similarities and some differences. And this is where this debate comes in. Some will say it's probably one species and we're just seeing variation because, you know, sometimes there's just variation. Um, depending on like geographical location, the adaptations to, the, to that geography. Some others would also say it's probably one species, but it's sexual dimorphism. Because as we know, that sexual dimorph dimorphism can cause major, you know, differences between males and females in, in a given species. Often, like, like take gorillas for example, I've given that example multiple times in this class, that male and female, the skulls look quite different. Um, and if you had never seen a gorilla, male or female, and you just were presented with those two skulls, you might at least outright think, you know, maybe it's two species, maybe it's, like, you would. it wouldn't be, like, obvious at first. It would definitely be something you'd have to get a little more information to be like, oh, okay, clearly it's just a one species that's highly sexually dimorphic. So this has been a question for, for Homo habilis versus Homo rudolfensis. Like, maybe this is one species, maybe it's all Homo habilis, and there's just, um, you know, a lot of sexual dimorphism. And then, of course, there are those who are like, no, it's clearly two different species. There are some major differences between the two, and so it's clearly two different species. And so what I want to point out to you is that, like I said, this idea is fairly resolved in that most people would say it is two species. And the thing I want to point out, like if you go back to slide five in that, that picture, you can see for those who think it's one species and it's sexual dimorphism, even in this like not great quality photo and two-dimensional just from one angle, hopefully you can still notice that some of those more robust or masculine features, like that really large brow ridge is one that kind of pops out, at least in this photo, is on the smaller one. And from everything that we know about how sexual dimorphism works in mammals, that's not how it works. It's the male who is the bigger one, not the smaller one um, in mammals. So <clears throat> uh, that doesn't seem to, to be the case. And for those who would just say, oh, it's general variation, there seems to also be like a lot of differences in the facial, craniofacial morphology that seem to be like different adaptations. Like after, of course, this is how it always works. After more specimens were, were, were discovered and they were able to see like, okay, clearly this looks like they're adapted to maybe slightly different things. Um, it's clear that, that, that it's two, two separate species. Um, and, but like I said, there will still be some who will argue it's, it's one that's sexually dimorphic and you know, you're always gonna have those, you know, 
you know, individuals who are, you know, just stuck on that, their particular hypothesis. But <clears throat> and then the last bullet point here is something we refer to in the field as lumper versus splitter, that some people are often lumpers or splitters, and basically what this means is that you want to either, like, every time there's a new species, a new discovery, you just lump it into something else, like, oh, everything's homo habilis, which, of course, can have its flaws into lumping everything. And then splitting, like, every new specimen that's found is a new species, you give a new species, like, that's, that we call those splitters. That's probably not accurate either. So to be a hardcore one of the other, not great, but for the most part, um, they both, you know, have their pros and cons, and uh, I would say I'm probably more, you know what, I don't know if I'd say I was a lumper or a splitter. I feel like, uh, I feel like I'm probably somewhere in between. It depends. It depends on which one, which thing we're talking about. Are we talking about Homo habilis versus Homo rudolfensis? Are we talking about Homo erectus versus Homo heidelbergensis? Which we'll get to that topic on the next PowerPoint. So it kind of just depends. But just don't be aware that there's this slight, you know, debate. Okay, so but actually now talking a little bit about Homo habilis, if you go to slide seven, you will see um, uh, a skull and you'll see one of those great Smithsonian recreations of what that individual would have looked like. So now we're starting to see, you know, something that looks a little more similar to us. Like I've said multiple times, not that there's a goal to look like us at all. That's not how evolution works. But if we're looking at our ancestry and we're like, just out of general human curiosity, we're like, I want to see something that looks like me. Now we're kind of starting to see that. So you can see there's this uh, range in brain size. Um, we're seeing that parabolic dental arch. Definitely seeing that now, which is what we talked about before with uh, one of those traits that, that characterizes hominins, one of those six traits. More rounded cranial vault. So look at the head on that skull. There's not like a modern like homo sapien forehead, but we're definitely seeing a forehead of some sort that we didn't see in those early species or genera. Not that there's a goal towards having a forehead, but it's just interesting that we can like identify these trends in evolutionary time. So we're starting to see that. Um, the brain is still like, it's not, you know, huge, but it's definitely, we're starting to see it get bigger. That's something we're seeing throughout our, you know, the hominin lineage. Um, so like I have your small brain, but still larger than Australopithecines. So we're seeing that, that progression. And, um, and then there's this question of, and this is more of a recent idea, should Homo habilis be included in the genus Homo? And the, one of the articles that you have to read um, for this class, for one of the article review assignments, gets into this idea a little bit, and, and then some surrounding um, um, species as well about how we are understanding, you know, uh, the Homo genus. That when you, not to get like too far into the actual article or related articles, but once you start looking at our genus as a whole, essentially Homo habilis is kind of an outlier. And um, so it's just interesting to think like, do we do we need to re kind of organize and categorize and understand our 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 genus in terms of Homo habilis, you know? It, made, it might have made sense, as I start talking about the whole article, it might have made sense initially that it was included and that it was distinct from the other um, species, genera, that we considered before. Hey, Waffle. Baby. Oh, no. She hasn't been snotty all week. Are you okay? Okay, just a little, a little bit, a little snot. Okay. Okay, so like I said, I'm not going to, like, tell you the whole article. You'll have to read it. Um, but it is a question. Okay, so and then once again, my one of my great uh, charts and paint, so slide eight, you can see um, just where I'm kind of talking about in this timeline. This is, you know, not an exact uh, uh, timeline. Like, this is just my very quick, just so you get a general idea. But what I want to point out is, yes, by looking at this chart, this is what I want to point out, is Homo habilis was existing at around the same time and in similar areas as the Paranthropines. So we see an overlap in the existence of these different species. And for us, it's interesting and kind of weird because we, like now in 2020, we're the only like currently existing hominin species is just Homo sapiens. But for the majority of hominin evolution, there were multiple hominin species existing at the same time. You know, Homo, even for like early Homo sapien that were Neanderthals still around and the Homo floresiensis. And, you know, back with Homo habilis, there's these Paranthropines and, the, you know, so if at any given time, there are multiple species existing um, multiple hominin species existing, you know, existing. 
and it's only until recently that we're the only one so but just be aware of that so that's kind of interesting slide nine homo erectus so this is the second one i want to talk about <clears throat> um you can see the picture of the skull and this amazing smithsonian recreation um oops sorry my powerpoint acted up okay um so looking at these bullet points here the second one east africa then out and basically what i'm saying is they are the first hominin to leave africa asterisk on that it seems as if in the last couple of years there's some research and some evidence that's been found that maybe that's not accurate and i don't want to say either way because like we're still as a, as a field like trying to determine if this is accurate um, it seems as if it might be, or at least there's a question, like a solid question about this. But as far as what we've known for like, you know, decades is that Homo erectus was absolutely had left Africa. Um, but just so you know, like there is a little debate recently about whether they were actually the first species to do so. Um, but you know, for this class, yes, they are. Um, so, so there were, we have evidence of Homo erectus living in Africa. Populations were in Africa. Populations were like in, in like southern parts of Europe, um, north, like North Africa, you know, Mediterranean area into Asia. Like they definitely moved around the world. Homo erectus did. <clears throat> Go to slide 10. Oh, but also don't, I know I've said this before too, don't over, -romant over romanticize this because I've heard this a lot like oh Homo erectus were you know they were tra world travelers and no that's not it it has nothing to do with that in fact it was probably very specific to one thing um we know that Homo um erectus were hunters and I think I'm gonna get to that in this powerpoint um they were probably just following migrating food their food um, so it wasn't like they were world travelers or that they were more human-like and so they had this need to be to, of curiosity like that's not like don't over romanticize erectus or humans that's just not how it works okay but back to some of these like biological morphological features you can see here <clears throat> that I have listed um, very thick cortical bone and if you're not sure about what cortical bone is let me draw you a picture I can use this in a while okay so <clears throat> Um, if you take the lab that goes with this course, you should learn this. And if you've taken the lab, hopefully you, whoever taught it, hopefully you did learn this, the difference between like cortical or like, um, trabecular, uh, cancellous, but like all these different, like how we, let me just draw you a picture. Okay. So like, obviously you guys know what a bone looks like, but imagine you cut a bone and you turn it. So you're looking at kind of the inside. Um, and so imagine it looks, this is not going to be the shittiest picture. I should just put, I should just put one in the PowerPoint. I don't know why. I probably do it because in my mind I'm like, I'll draw a picture. And then I forget like I'm shitty at drawing. Okay. So, God, that's, I, I can't even show you that. I have to, oh, okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> imagine, imagine you're looking at a bone, like it's been cut and you're looking and there's this hollow, the medullary cavity where like bone marrow would, would be and stuff. And then the bone, um, let me just draw a little bit more. Okay, so imagine we have two different types of bone and the bone's not solid all the way through. In this middle part, it's, I don't call it spongy bone. And I know the book calls it spongy bone as like a nickname. It's a misnomer because it's not spongy or absorbent. It's more porous. And this outside is more dense. And this is the cortical bone. Um, basically, imagine um, if you've ever like taken like a cardboard box and you've like looked actually looked at the interior of the cardboard, you're like, oh, it's like solid on the outside and the inside it's, it's like this, it's more porous. Basically, it's how do you get the sturdiness of the item, cardboard or bone, um, but still be lightweight to where it's like functional. Um, because imagine if your bones were dense all the way through, you know, you, how are you gonna fucking lift them and stuff, you know? So it's, it's about that. But anyway, back to Homo erectus though. For Homo erectus, this cortical bone is very, th like noticeably thicker um, than species before and even a lot of the species, species after. So there's this question of like, why is this? And for the most part, researchers will say, 
it has to do because we see other like really um you can see on powerful i'm pointing like you can see what i'm pointing to um that there are other features to them that are really unique morphologically like osteologically and so it's it's meant or it, most oh my god most researchers think it has something to do with like this buttressing system that they had a very like, active lifestyle probably it's something to, to do with them like hunting they were the first hominins to be hunters um and that they had this very like physically demanding active lifestyle and probably even to the point where they were being hurt in direct contact with animals possibly there's a lot of hypotheses about this but we do know that they like osteologically they are very unique and so it seems as if this probably fits um that that a lot of their like their cortical bones thicker because like that's a that's a that's a cost to your body um so there must be a reason why it's there and like I said, it goes in with some of these other like craniofacial features that we see, this really prominent brow ridge, this feature called a sagittal keel. So this is not the same thing as a sagittal crest that we saw in the paranthropines. So here, here I'll draw another, another shitty picture. Okay, so remember that the sagittal crest, so imagine you're looking at the top of the head of like a paranthropine. God, that's a horrible picture, okay, again. So imagine you're looking at the top of the head. They had that crest, remember? And that's where those muscles of mastication, they need extra bone to come up and attach to, right? Homo erectus has something called a sagittal keel. It is not the same thing and it doesn't serve the same function. So it looks more, and you can kind of see this in the picture. This is why I put that picture. It looks more like that. It's just this raised area. It's in the same location. It's along that sagittal suture. It's in the same location, but it's more like rounded smooth it's not for muscle attachment it's not the same like purpose function and so it seems as if like i said i have here this cranial buttresses buttressing system it seems as if a lot of these osteological features are meant to kind of like be are functional for like uh, shock or stress absorption like i said the the oh my god like i said in paleoanthropology, it's not 100% agreed on this. There's still a little like debate about it, but it's probably most would agree on that. <clears throat> okay. The next slide, slide 11. So a couple famous examples of Homo erectus. We have this one, uh, Turcana, <clears throat> boy. Um, very famous. Well, one look super almost complete, like 80% complete an amazing uh, find. And they were able to estimate that this individual was probably about 11 or 12 years old. And that um, that in adulthood, did I have the ramps in here? Oh, I guess I don't. That in adulthood, he would have been, you know, probably around like 5'10 to 6 feet tall. Um, <clears throat> so now we're seeing like modern stature. Not like I said, not that there's any goal to being tall, but it's interesting to see like a lot of the stuff is happening around Homo erectus. You know, brains are getting, brains are getting bigger. Um, you know, like I said in the previous PowerPoint or the previous slide, uh, 10,000 cc's or 10,000. Good Lord, Alicia, a thousand cc's. Um, so jumping up, um, modern, modern height. You know, um, very interesting. Okay, so go to slide 12. Another one, uh, another famous example. This famous skull cap that was found. So we call this like a skull cap, skull cap. So a lot of these preserved for erectus, um, this part, like basically from, from the brows, this part of the frontal bone and basically back, that preserves, and the bones of the face tend to be a little um, more, what's the word I'm thinking of? Um, more fragile in general for, for most species. Um, so finding like that part of the head is actually really common, especially in erectus because they have this really thick cortical bone in, in, in the, you know, those bones of the, of the head too. Um, so, so we have the, the very first um, um, Homo erectus was this um, skull cap. So, and we see multiple of these. Um, okay, slide 13. Uh, another site, uh, Jukurien, and the individuals from this site were uh, nicknamed Peking Man. So you'll see, I'd have to think about it for a second, but like Homo erectus has, like when it first was found, it wasn't like everyone was like, let's call it Homo erectus, and everyone agreed. No, there's like so many different names, either like nicknames like this, like Java Man, Peking Man, or other like actual um, 
species names that it was given, like Pekinensis. Like now we, like we, in the field, we're like, that's all Erectus. We know that we know that as a field, but if you didn't know that and you were like looking at a really old, you know, textbook or something and you were like, hmm, Peking man, is that like, this? it's Erectus. Everyone's very excited, like back to this idea of lumber versus splitter. Like you find a new skull, must be a new species. Yeah, of course not, you know. <clears throat> okay, so um, there's evidence that Homo Erectus was the first um, hominin, or at least where we have the evidence that they were absolutely had the use of fire and probably hearths. So, you know, like creating like some kind of, you know, fire pit of some sort. What were they doing with it? You know, did species before this, did Homo habilis have use of fire? And we just don't have evidence of it. You know, possibly. But for Homo erectus, we know that they, that they definitely did. Slide 14, Eugene Dubois. So remember that I talked about Raymond Dart when I talked about um, Australopithecus africanus and similar story with Eugene Dubois. So he was convinced that the human origins would be found in Asia. So when he looked at the apes, he thought that the ones that were more similar to humans were probably the Asian apes like orangutans and gibbons. And so he thought he would find like, you know, human ancestral stuff in in Asia. And he's not wrong. Like we, there is stuff in Asia, there's stuff, you know, in a lot of different places. But so he went there and he kind of moved his whole family there and they were, you know, um, you know, on these on these excavations, he went there with um, the. Um, why am I blanking? Do I have it on the next slide? Dutch Army. I was gonna say someone something Army. Okay, so on slide fifteen, he went there with the Dutch Army. He moved his whole family, and you know they were convinced they were gonna find some stuff. They he found the skull cap, and I think they ended up finding like um like a fee a tibia or something. Um, but then like as a story, like crazy story that while they're there, the fam all the family, they all get malaria, like they all survive, but they get malaria, and then like their team, part of their t excavation team, like stole their equipment and like abandoned them, and he was like, oh my God, you know? And then of course, like he comes back, and he's like trying to tell every everyone, like similar to, to Dart, like, hey, I found this skull cap. This is like a big brained biped. It's gotta be something in our, in our lineage. Um, and just like with Dart, because he found stuff in Africa, you know, a lot of these European scientists were like, no, you found it in Asia, it can't be right. You know, because they have this bias, like I said before, they had this bias that they were going to find everything in Europe, and it, only stuff in Europe was going to be valid. Everything else was probably just a monkey or an ape. It couldn't possibly be in the human lineage. And, you know, Dubois was, was correct, as was Dart. And um, it wasn't until much later that, you know, we realized this. And, uh, you know, Dubois, Eugene Dubois ended up going back to Asia a couple times trying to find more, and it just didn't really happen. But a lot of people thought, like, they're like, oh, no, that's just a giant gibbon like it must be an ancestral gibbon and then he's like no like this he was right you know they were wrong but at the time same thing with dart uh okay slide 16. so you may have seen this um not debate but n different naming that you might see homo erectus versus homo ergaster and basically this is referencing that the Homo erectus that were still in Africa versus those who left Africa have some different adaptations. And some will call them by completely different species name, Homo erectus, Homo ergaster. I do not. My colleagues do not. We consider them all one species with just some slight um, geographical variation. But just know like there are those who would give it a whole new species name. They would be, there would be, you know, splitters. They would say, nope, it's a different species. And like we do know that the erectus, or, the erectus in Africa and the erectus in Asia do have some different differences geographically. That shouldn't be a surprise to you. Um, but just know that some would give it a completely different species name and I would say that's probably not correct. So I guess I'm not a, I'm not a splitter, at least in that regard, okay. Slide 17, stone tools. We could spend an, a whole PowerPoint talking about stone tools. Stone tools are not my expertise. Um, but I can talk a little bit about them and, and some very general stuff that I want you to know for this class that we see stone tools with our genus. Um, we see stone tools with Homo habilis. The first time we see stone tools is with Homo habilis. Um, now did the other species before have stone tools and we don't have evidence? Maybe. Did they have other really great tools made out of wood that just didn't preserve? 
you know, probably. Um, but we do know that we at least have the evidence of the first stone tools with Homo habilis. And this was why, like I said before, initially it was deemed that this was a, um, a marker for something new and innovative, something that has separated this group from the previous group, which is why Homo habilis was given this new you know, genus specification with Homo. Um, <clears throat> but like I said, reading that article and some other articles, I don't wanna to give too much of it away, but just like, is that enough? That's the question. But anyway, so Homo habilis had the stone tool technology that we have like, labeled Oldowan tools, um, and Homo erectus had a stone tool technology called, that we have given the name Acheulean tools. And I have just some brief points about each of those two and some pictures. And basically the difference is, is imagine you um, took um, two stones and you broke or you like knocked them into each other and hoping to at least get pieces to break off and get some sharp edge on one of those rocks. That's essentially what an old Awan tool is. Now, this does not imply that Homo habilis could not have made something more complex. The only thing you can assume from that is they didn't need to make anything more complex. Um, we see something more complex with the Acheulean tools. It's not just you know breaking off once or twice to get a sharp edge, which like I said, worked really well for what Homo habilis needed it for. Um, why did I like blame? Okay, but for the Acheulean tools, we see they're clearly like, um, working this stone at multiple angles, like they would have taken hours and hours. So imagine spending like five, ten minutes on a stone tool versus spending, you know, five, six hours on a stone tool, a completely different process. And what we can see is with the Acheulean tool, something called a mental template that you, that whoever's making this tool had to have in their mind a picture like this is what I want this tool to look like and then they spent hours creating that thing versus the old one tools you're like I need a sharp edge you know hitting it together and then getting a sharp edge like I said it doesn't imply that homo habilis who who used old one tools very successfully for like a long time it doesn't imply that they couldn't have made something more complex all it implies all that we can assume from that is that they didn't need anything more complex but with erectus they did need something more complex because of what they were doing and this is the main difference is, go to slide uh, 18, we know that um, Homo habilis were scavengers. Scavenging, there are two types, passive versus active. Passive scavenging is you are an animal that happens to come across a carcass and uh, that another animal is killed and eaten and you get some leftover stuff. Maybe there's a little bit of muscle left, maybe a little bit, a little bit of fat, um, but there's definitely bone and there's definitely bone marrow and this is super important for homo habilis to get the bone marrow So now suddenly they have this introduction into their diet because they were eating everything's plants 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 Different types of plants, but it's all plants up until this point Homo habilis is the first to now introduce something new into the diet a great source of fat in the bone marrow So This is really important and then we see um this transition you know, to being like more active scavenging, which is, uh, active scavenging is um, you're not killing the animal, you're waiting for like a, a, another predator to kill the animal, but then you find a way to get that uh, predator to run, to go away, and then you now have access to that, mostly that full carcass. Um, so imagine if like there's a lion, you're like waiting for the lion to kill the zebra, and you find a way to scare the lion away, maybe your group of hominins, and now you didn't have to spend a lot of the effort to kill that. Um, zebra, but now you have access to pretty much the whole carcass. So now you have access to the to the meat, um, the marrow, like all of it. So we see this progression. And, we, and by the time we have Homo erectus, they're actually actively hunting. Now you can imagine being a scavenger, as Homo habilis were, and just needing a tool to break open bone. Simple, but simple tool for that, but a great resource um, that you would have something like an old one tool to break open those bones versus if now you're a hunter and you're homo erectus and you have to strategize and plan to take down an animal, the weapons that you might create to do that are gonna be new, different. Um, the tools that you might have to process that animal um, are gonna be different. 
um, probably a little more complex if before you only needed something to break open bones to get marrow versus now you need to like find a way to remove you know tissue and skin and and muscle tissue that the tools will be different doesn't imply that homo habilis if they needed to could not have created something very complex like the usually tool they just didn't they didn't need to um, there there is no goal in evolution to become a carnivore that's not how it works um, there's no goal to in our in our lineage to have be, to have started to introduce um, meat that's not how it works but what we do know is that it was really important and this is what I want to get to with this last bullet uh, this last slide is that there's often this misconception about meat eating and big brains and hominins this is not a like a one-to-one -one scenario it's not as if oh introducing meat suddenly gave us big brains because we can look at meat eaters in the animal kingdom and they don't all have big brains it's not really how it works it had to be this great combination and this is what's often forgotten is that we're eating plants up to this point and even when we're meat eaters even with like homo erectus neanderthals early humans modern humans um the amount of meat in our diet for these early hunters imagine like about the size of your fist about once a week that's that's it sometimes less sometimes more there's going to be variation in that um, but it's not a lot it's still 90 percent plant um but plants for this whole time suddenly the introduction of this great fat resource and now a new package of, of protein in a smaller package so now we have this great combination this is what i want to point out this great combination of From plants we have something from the marrow we have something and then from the muscle we have something this great combination of glucose fat and protein now I want to be clear obviously most of you are well are aware you could get protein from plants like you don't need meat to get protein um, in fact it's higher quality protein to get it from plants but that's because we live in a very globalized world. You can go to the grocery store and, and buy a can of you know, kidney beans. Um, obviously, Homo erectus couldn't do that. So it's a, a different story back then. But also something that's often forgotten is you need a lot of glucose to power your brain. If you don't have a high amount of glucose, you cannot power your brain. So it's not like, oh, we need a protein. That's not, no. It had to be this great combination with the majority of it being glucose for our brains to be powered. You use 25% of your body's energy on just that one organ, and it has to be powered by mostly glucose. So it still had to be this great, this high quality plant items. We get, a, we get some fat from the marrow, we get some, a little more protein um, from the, uh, the muscle, and we have this great combination at the right time and the right adaptations for our brains to suddenly get bigger. So please be aware that it's this combination of things. And it had to be this combination of things for it to happen. Okay, um, that's it for, for early homo. And I will see you guys on the next one.